Coming up in this episode of KMOS Presents Missouri Life. We're on the road to Herman, Missouri, where we'll visit a wine cellar that survived Prohibition. We'll go back in time to tour an 1850s farm, and we'll dance around the Maypole. KMOS Presents Missouri Life. Let's discover. Funding for KMOS Presents Missouri Life is provided by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. already know that when Central Missouri is in the mood for a little vino, they head to Herman, designated in 1983 as an American viticultural area. A what? That means the seven wineries in Herman account for more than a third of the Show Me State's wine output. In 1837, a group of German immigrants living in Philadelphia felt they were becoming too Americanized. Too American. And hired German school teacher George Bayer to travel to the new ish state of Missouri to find a place where they could maintain their German traditions. Bayer bought the opposite of what his Philly investors expected 11,000 acres of some of the most rugged terrain to be found along the Missouri River. But the planners back home had already laid out a map for Herman, not knowing what the land would look like a map with wide boulevards and open, spacious town squares. And when the folks from back home landed in their new city, well, they knew they had a big hill to climb. <gasps> but you know what grows well on a hillside? Grapes. Yes! By the early 20th century, Missouri wine was making the transplants big American money. Herman was on the map, was still totally German, and was popular with the swells from St. Louis as a tourist destination. But then, dun, dun, dun. between prohibition and anti-German sentiment after World War I, Herman's party was over. And it stayed over for a while. But after World War II, Herman rebuilt its wine industry and became a destination again. Ta-da! And oh, by the way, Herman comes from Herman der Cherusker, who defeated the Romans in year nine. That's right, just nine. Not something in nine, just nine. In the late 1800s, the French wine industry nearly collapsed. Why? Well, this little guy, Phylloxera, the pest native to the U.S., but when it somehow made its way to France, it killed nearly every vine. Enter Missouri entomologist C.V. Riley and Missouri farmers who saved the day. Missouri certainly played a part in um, what was perhaps one of the biggest disasters, uh, agricultural disasters of all time, and that is when a grapevine pest known as phylloxera, native to North America, so native North American grapes, like the Norton, were resistant to that. But unfortunately, somehow that got transferred to Europe and escaped into the commercial uh, vineyards in Europe and those European varieties like Chardonnay and Cabernet and Merlot, no resistance whatsoever, and it killed the vines completely. So the first thing that happened was that uh, um, a gentleman by the name of C.V. Riley, who was the Missouri entomologist back at that time, about 1870, played a significant role in demonstrating that that's why all the vines were dying in France. And so now then they, they went about trying to figure out, well, what can we do? Because they couldn't really kill this, this pest or anything. So they tried a number of things. And one of the things that worked was to uh, graft the Chardonnay or Merlot variety onto a Native American rootstock that was resistant to the phylloxera. And so that turned out to be the savior, and Missouri played a huge role in uh, supplying those rootstocks and developing that whole 
idea. So, you know, I, I wouldn't say Missouri was alone, but it played a significant role in saving the French wine industry at that point in time. Wine expert Dave Johnson should know. In his role as winemaker at Herman's Stonehill Winery, Johnson studies plants and bugs and dirt and grapes to create wines for Stonehill, one of Missouri's oldest wineries. Stonehill Winery was one of the largest wineries in the world at one point in time, and this would have been back in the 1870s, that period, believed to have been the second largest winery in the United States. And even though we're now a fairly large winery by Midwest standards, it's believed that they were at least five times that size back at that point in time. Herman was uh, a very important center for wine growing back at that time. Um, probably 26 wineries in this town. The entire uh, economy of Herman was uh, centered around winemaking. Unfortunately, when Prohibition came, um, that put, a, put an end to that. And so most all of the vines were torn out, the wineries closed. This particular winery, because of all of its cool underground cellars, turned out to be a great place to grow mushrooms. Uh, mushrooms were grown for a number of years in those cool, damp underground cellars. But prohibition didn't last forever, and as a result, the once forgotten Stone Hill site gained renewed interest in the late 20th century. In 1965, the owners of the Mushroom Company um, wanted to see the facility return to its previous glorious winery and found a, um, a couple by the name of Jim and Betty Held who had some grapes, were growing grapes, and asked them if they were interested in kind of starting things up again. And that's exactly what they did. Um, started out small and uh, we've grown back to being one of the larger wineries in the Midwest, uh, the second largest in Missouri. We produce about 100,000 cases of wine a year. The main building up the hill is the original uh, winery building that was built shortly thereafter, after 1847, and is still being used today. Um, of course, the cellars are all original underground cellars, also built uh, in probably the 10 years following 1847, something like that. The building that's right down the hill from us um, is a beautiful old building uh, that we're restoring and that we are going to uh, uh, be turning into um, a distillery and hopefully soon we'll uh, start that distillery up and, and add something that was done at Stonehill back before Prohibition on a fairly large scale back to the uh, portfolio of products that we have. Johnson says Missouri's climate poses challenges for any would-be winemakers. Because Missouri is a very continental climate, meaning in the middle of the continent, um, and also it's very uh, humid in the summertime, it's not the best place probably to grow things like Merlot and Chardonnay and all those European varieties. So instead we've focused on varieties that actually grow very well here. And of course the most famous of those is Norton. And Norton is a Native American variety, was probably originally from Virginia, but we know by the uh, middle of the 1800s, it was being widely grown throughout Missouri and Arkansas. In fact, a Missouri a Herman Norton wine was named the best red wine of all nations at the 1873 Vienna World's Fair. May have been a Stonehill Norton, there's a little debate on that, but we, we like to think it was. So whether you're a budding vinter, a history buff, or you just like to sip wine, Stonehill opens its doors and displays most of its secrets every day. You know, we do um, tours every day, and those tours give folks the opportunity to go through these uh, amazing historic cellars. People love to go through and see those old cellars full of uh, barrels of Norton and Chamberson, another red variety that we grow and some other uh, wines. We also have a special tour that we do um, on occasion, one that I lead, and it's kind of, you might call it a VIP tour or something like that, but anyone can sign up for it. We do it about every other month, and that's a really in-depth 
uh, opportunity for me to lead a group of people who are really interested through the sellers, through actually our production facility that's normally not on the tour, where our presses and crushing material and fermentation, big stainless fermentation tanks and so on uh, would be. So if you're coming to visit the winery, you can take the beautiful tour through the cool cellars, a great thing at this time of year or you can call and sign up for uh, the Grapes to Glass tour that I lead. Hi, my name is Eric Bodeker, and today's Missouri flavor is the Herman Wursthaus. Four years ago, award-winning sausage maker Mike Sloan saw a vacant building in Herman, Missouri, and decided to make it into much more. My wife and I bought this building in June of 2011. And uh, prior to us buying this building in June of 2011, this building was vacant. It was vacant for about five years. And prior to it being vacant for five years, it was an auto parts store. So we got rid of all the spark plugs and fan belts and things that I didn't think I was going to need to make sausage with and opened up the Herman Worst House in September of 2011. So we've been here almost four years. This deli style restaurant has bratwurst, hickory smoked pulled pork, deli meat sandwiches, German specialties, and even makes specialty beer and soda to wash it all down. What makes us so specialized is we make 45 flavors of different bratwurst. Uh, we make also uh, 12 flavors of handcrafted bacon, and we also make 10 flavors of summer sausage. We make uh, brown swagger, German bolognas. We also make jams, jellies, and sauces. We're also into, into the beer and the soda business. Uh, we make five different flavors of craft sodas, and four flavors of craft beer. And we make our beer and our sodas and our uh, jams and jellies and sauces at another location. This location here at the Herman Wurst House is where we make all of our, our uh, award-winning bratwurst, summer sausages, bacons, brown swaggers, and German bolognese. Currywurst is a German-style street vendor sausage. Oh, over the course of my career, of course, I've been doing this for a long time. I've, I've won over 395 state, national, and regional awards. Now, since I've been here at the Herman Wurst House in four years, you know, we, we've competed in about four or five different uh, major competitions. And out of those four or five, we, we have about 50 or about 50 or 60 awards. So uh, as, as a new business owner, uh, not working for somebody else, I'm kind of starting over. But I'm, I'm slowly but surely gaining those awards back. Mike has been in the business for over 40 years, gaining his experience through the rich German heritage all throughout Herman. Okay, so growing growing up in the Herman community, I was influenced by some German butchers that I worked with very early in age. And I started in the business when I was about nine years old. And uh, of course, I didn't know much then. I was just kind of the, the, the go-to guy to get things. But I helped and watched some of these older German butchers. And they were well into their 50s and 60s at that time. And uh, they taught me a lot of, a lot of the German process and the, a lot of the German seasonings and spices and uh, it's all good knowledge that I still use and continue today. To ensure the quality of their product, everything is done in-house. I mean everything. We make all of our sausages on site, and we buy beef and pork and lamb from local farmers. But once we start making something, we do the actual, everything gets done here, it never leaves the building. Yeah, from the raw product coming in to the packaged product going out the door. Mike holds taste tests every day so his customers know exactly just what they're getting. We have, every day we have a sample taste testing of five or six different flavors of the 45 flavors that we make. So it, it's a narrative type deal where myself and one of my staff, we will cut and slice the different products, the different bratwurst for them, and people will get a chance to sample taste test before they actually buy. And, it, and it's a good deal for them. It's a fun thing. It's, it's, it's a wine, if you would think of a wine tasting with worst. All right, so it's the worst, worst tasting bar. It's the worst bar in Herman. So it's a really good fun, and we, we make it fun. Uh, we keep it uh, every day, and it's, it's a good deal. For more information, you can visit hermanworsthouse.com. If you're ready to take a trip back to the pre-Civil War era, Herman is just about ready to open one of the largest living history museums in Missouri, an 1850s era farm that will take visitors back in time. So if, if uh, these people came back who were here, who built the house, they would say, yeah, it's our, you know, nothing's changed, nothing, it's all the same. 
or developer Jim Deerberg trying to recreate an era when things were handmade and horses carried much of the load of the work on a farm, the area around Herman just made sense. Herman is an easier project than trying to redevelop something that has already been almost totally redeveloped, like Washington is, Missouri is almost a suburb of St. Louis, Jefferson City has the capital. I mean, you're not going to change that. You're not going to move the capital to go back to uh, this kind of a thing. So Herman is sort of, it not, not only is it unique, uh, but it's also the right size to do it. And so that's uh, what attracted me. And just like the German immigrants who moved to Herman to preserve their past, Deerberg is out to preserve some of that past as well. And as the world develops, we're all losing these cultures. We're all becoming uh, more similar than dissimilar. And I think that's a, a shame because that uniqueness is being lost over this period of time and soon will have been gone, period. And so I'm trying to preserve it here. That's, that's what we're trying to do is to not lose that identity. That, that's why the, uh, they came from Philadelphia because they thought back in 1837 they were losing their identity to the Americans in Philadelphia. And so they came here to keep it. And I, I, I'm an extension or this farm is an extension of that. I think what people take away is how little it looks different, but how little things change, and also the struggle that these people had. Uh, so you look and say, oh, that must have been hard work, you know? I don't, I'm not used to that kind of work. None of us are anymore. MyFest is traditionally held on the third week of May. This year is our 63rd annual MyFest. Dating back before the first public MyFest, MyFest was a celebration of spring that uh, school kids did. Uh, Sunday, uh, the last day of, of the school year, and uh, it grew into the tradition that we have now. But the, as history will show you, the first public MyFest was uh, held in the 50s by the Brush and Pallet Club to raise money for the Rotunda building here in town. And uh, they, they advertised around, you know, uh, what they could, and uh, 40,000 people descended on an unsuspecting Herman. So from then on, it became a tradition. On Friday night, there's usually a band and then a beer garden. Every day there is a beer garden, it's a tradition. Uh, and it tours at the wineries and, and uh, all the businesses too. Saturday and Sunday, both days, you have uh, the Volksplatz, which are uh, German style vendors on, on Gutenberg Street. Uh, the Worst Jaeger dancers, they perform at, uh, at Stonehill both days and uh, the MyPole dancing uh, that uh, is held at the corner of a couple different streets throughout town at different times of the, of the day. Herman is unique in the area because uh, most of the traditions, the architecture, the genealogy, the history of those German people that settled are, is, is evident everywhere you look in Herman, whether it be the architecture or if you go to the, uh, uh, any given coffee shop, you know, people still have that, that faint German accent, you know, so it's alive here still. You don't, you don't leave the modern day behind, but you, you don't neglect your, your heritage. It's, it's two, both things can coincide and exist at the same time. Um, a lot of other communities along the Missouri River that have the same type of history uh, have been uh, or have become more commercialized. Um, Herman, not so much, but that's not a bad thing. Uh, it hasn't been uh, tainted or tampered with, so it's unique. If you've seen artwork by Joey Lose, typically large pieces of painted metal, you might imagine a beefy welder chomping his cigar. But in fact, this Joey is not at all what one might expect. Yeah, and they think they're expecting to meet probably a man. And a lot of people that have come to welded steel sculptures come more from the welding background where they've been metal fabricators and then they later get into making sculptures with their work. This is Joey Lose former organic farmer turned metal sculptor. 
but I started as an art student and then later got into making welded steel sculptures. My dad had sold welding supplies and I was an organic vegetable farmer for some time and so that's kind of what brought me into the welding. I thought, well, we're taking all these things to get them repaired. I might as well try and learn it myself even though I had been hesitant. I'll go ahead and give it a try and I found I really, really liked it and it wasn't as difficult as I thought and people are happy to give you scrap metal, especially when the scrap metal prices are low so there's always a lot of material around to play with. From insects and mythical creatures to allegorical figures, Los has work all over mid-Missouri, from Columbia to Herman and in between. Well, in the Herman area, I have work on public display at the Herman Hill Wedding Chapel, at the Herman Hospital, and most recently at the Amtrak train station. So that was pretty exciting to have a public commission at the train station. And um, in the Columbia area, I have several pieces around. I've been represented by Blue Stem Gallery of Missouri Crafts for about 18 years now, as long as I've been doing the welded steel sculptures. So I have pieces in Boone County Regional Hospital, at the Landmarks Bank, Calvary Episcopalian Church, and the University of Missouri. I love me working with metal because it's very direct and instant gratification and it's durable so my sculptures are going to be around a lot longer than I am. I do a lot of painted pieces that protects the metal from corroding and I think that's kind of my niche in the metal sculpture area because you see a lot of people that make metal sculptures from scrap metal and they just put the pieces together and that's nice. I started out doing that too but then I just found out paint really adds a lot to them. <laughs> so I do a lot of painted pieces. Of course, working with huge hunks of metal can be a challenge and not just artistically. And there are some engineering problems, especially with the bigger pieces. And so I've had the good opportunity on a couple of occasions to actually work with metal fabricators and professional metal workers and engineers to do some much, much bigger pieces that I couldn't really do on my own because there are some engineering difficulties that you have to assess for some pieces <laughs> and especially with it, like how they will stand up or how they'll be mounted on a wall or you know whether it's going to be a heavy enough base for the amount of mass you have on top. For her next set of works, Lois is looking forward to telling stories. I'm interested in doing a lot more like narrative pieces some similar to this piece you see behind me that are actually like kind of telling a whole story or there are figures that really tell tell a story about themselves, you know, so you can look at it and kind of get an idea of, oh, what's the story behind that? Or it's really telling you something. So one of my favorite things to do is um, like a commission piece where you'll tell me you have an idea for a sculpture and then I put some drawings on paper and get back to you and see if this is kind of what you were thinking. And then I get the opportunity to kind of take your idea and your story and make it in steel. <laughs> so that's been really fun. And I think some of my most interesting and exciting projects have come about because of collaborations with my clients. Many weary miles I've traveled round this world for years, and it's many more I yet expect to roam. And when I lay me down to sleep, there in my dream appears 
the vision of my dear old German home. And when my days are over here, if it be for the best, much joy and comfort it would bring to me. Could I but close my eyelids there and lay me down to sleep in that little German home across the sea? No matter where I roam, I don't forget my home. Oh, that home that was ever dear to me. And it's many, many times a day my thoughts just fly away to that little German home across the sea. And when my days are over here, if it be for the best, much joy and comfort it would bring to me. Could I but close my eyelids there and lay me down to sleep in that little German home across the sea. Funding for KMOS Presents Missouri Life is provided by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.